Pearl Jam is an American rock band formed in Seattle, Washington, in 1990. The band's lineup consists of founding members Jeff Ament, bass guitar, Stone Gossard, rhythm guitar, Mike McCready, lead guitar, and Eddie Vedder, lead vocals, guitar, as well as Matt Cameron, drums, who joined in 1998. Keyboardist Boom Gasper has also been a touring slash session member with the band since 2002. Drummers Jack Irons, Dave Crusson, Matt Chamberlain, and Dave Abruzzes are former members of the band. Pearl Jam outsold many of their contemporaries from the early 1990s, and are considered one of the most influential bands of the decade, being dubbed as the most popular American rock and roll band of the 90s. Formed after the demise of Gossard and Amon's previous band, Mother Love Bone, Pearl Jam broke into the mainstream with their debut album, Ten in 1991. Ten stayed on the Billboard 200 chart for nearly five years, and has gone on to become one of the highest-selling rock records ever, going 13 times platinum in the United States. Released in 1993, Pearl Jam's second album, V.S., sold over 950,000 copies in its first week of release, setting the record for most copies of an album sold in its first week of release at the time. Their third album, Vita Loki, 1994, became the second fastest selling CD in history at the time, with more than 877,000 units sold in its first week. One of the key bands in the grunge movement of the early 1990s, Pearl Jam's members often shunned popular music industry practices such as making music videos or participating in interviews. The band also sued Ticketmaster claiming it had monopolized the concert ticket market. In 2006, Rolling Stone described the band as having spent much of the past decade deliberately tearing apart their own fame. Pearl Jam had sold more than 85 million albums worldwide by 2018, including nearly 32 million albums in the United States by 2012, making them one of the best-selling bands of all time. Pearl Jam was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2017 in its first year of eligibility. They were ranked 8th in a reader's poll by Rolling Stone magazine in its Top 10 Live Acts of All Time issue. Throughout its career, the band has also promoted wider social and political issues, from pro-abortion rights sentiments to opposition to George W. Bush's presidency. Vetter acts as the band's spokesman on these issues. Stone Gossard and Jeff Ament were members of grunge band Green River during the mid-1980s. Green River toured and recorded to moderate success but disbanded in 1987 due to a stylistic division between the peer and bandmates Mark Arm and Steve Turner. In late 1987, Gossard and Ament began playing with malfunction vocalist Andrew Wood, eventually organizing the band Mother Love Bone. In 1988 and 1989, the band recorded and toured to increasing interest and found the support of the Polygram record label, which signed the band in early 1989. Mother Love Bone's debut album, Apple, was released in July 1990, four months after Wood died of a heroin overdose. Amant and Gossard were devastated by the death of Wood and the resulting demise of Mother Love Bone. Gossard spent his time afterwards writing material that was harder edged than what he had been doing previously. After a few months, Gossard started practicing with fellow Seattle guitarist Mike McCready, whose band, Shadow, had broken up, McCready in turn encouraged Gossard to reconnect with Amant. After practicing for a while, the trio sent out a five-song demo tape in order to find a singer and a drummer. They gave former Red Hot Chili Peppers drummer Jack Irons the demo to see if he would be interested in joining the band and to distribute the demo to anyone he felt might fit the lead vocal position. Irons passed on the invitation but gave the demo to his friend Eddie Vedder. Vedder was the lead vocalist for a San Diego band Bad Radio and worked part-time at a gas station. He listened to the tape shortly before going surfing, where lyrics came to him. He then recorded the vocals to three of the songs, Alive, Once, and Footsteps, in what he later described as a mini-opera titled Mamazin. Vedder sent the tape with his vocals back to the three Seattle musicians, who were impressed enough to fly Vedder up to Seattle for an audition. 
Within a week, Vedder had joined the band. With the addition of Dave Crusson on drums, the band took the name Mookie Blaylock, in reference to the then active basketball player. The band played its first official show at the Off Ramp Cafe in Seattle on October 22, 1990. They opened for Alice in Chains at the Moore Theater in Seattle on December 22, 1990, and served as the opening act for the band's facelift tour in 1991. Mookie Blaylock soon signed to Epic Records and renamed themselves Pearl Jam. In an early promotional interview, Vedder said that the name Pearl Jam was a reference to his great-grandmother Pearl, who was married to a Native American and had a special recipe for peyote lace jam. In a 2006 cover story for Rolling Stone, Vedder admitted that the story was total bullshit, but he did have a great-grandma named Pearl. Amont and McCready explained that Amont came up with Pearl, and that the band later settled on Pearl Jam after attending a Neil Young concert, in which he extended his songs as improvisations of 15 to 20 minutes in length. Pearl Jam entered Seattle's London Bridge Studios in March 1991 to record its debut album 10. McCready said that 10 was mostly Stone and Jeff, Eddie and I were along for the ride at that time. Crusson left the band in May 1991 after checking himself into rehabilitation for alcoholism, he was replaced by Matt Chamberlain, who previously played with Edie Brickell and New Bohemians. After playing only a handful of shows, one of which was filmed for the Alive video, Chamberlain left to join the band for Saturday Night Live. Chamberlain suggested Dave Abruzzes as his replacement. Abruzzes joined the group and played the rest of Pearl Jam's live shows supporting 10. Released on August 27, 1991, 10, named after Mookie Blaylock's jersey number, contained 11 tracks dealing with dark subjects like depression, suicide, loneliness, and murder. Ten's musical style, influenced by classic rock, combined an expansive harmonic vocabulary with an anthemic sound. The album was slow to sell, but by the second half of 1992 it became a breakthrough success, being certified gold and reaching number two on the Billboard charts. Ten produced the hit singles Alive, Even Flow, and Jeremy. Originally interpreted as an anthem by many, Vedder later revealed that Alive tells the semi-autobiographical tale of a son discovering that his father is actually his stepfather, and his mother's grief turns her to sexually embrace her son, who strongly resembles the biological father. In this lyric, even though Vedder originally looked at being alive as a curse, as the sadness the speaker in the song suggests, but as fans quickly turned the title phrase into a self-empowering anthem, particularly at Pearl Jam concerts, Vedder said, they lifted the curse. The audience changed the meaning for me, he told VH1 Storytellers in 2006. The song Jeremy and its accompanying video were inspired by a true story in which a high school student shot himself in front of his classmates. Ten stayed on the Billboard charts for nearly five years, going 13 times platinum. With the success of 10, Pearl Jam became a key member of the Seattle grunge explosion, along with Alice in Chains, Nirvana, and Soundgarden. The band was criticized in the music press, British music magazine NME wrote that Pearl Jam was trying to steal money from young alternative kids' pockets. Nirvana's Kurt Cobain angrily attacked Pearl Jam, claiming the band were commercial sellouts, and argued 10 was not a true alternative album because it had so many prominent guitar leads. Cobain later reconciled with Vedder, and they reportedly were on amicable terms before Cobain's death in 1994. Pearl Jam toured relentlessly in support of 10. Amon stated that essentially 10 was just an excuse to tour, adding, We told the record company, we know we can be a great band, so let's just get the opportunity to get out and play. The band's manager Kelly Curtis stated, once people came and saw them live, this light bulb would go on. Doing their first tour, you kind of knew it was happening and there was no stopping it. Early on in Pearl Jam's career, the band became known for its intense live performances. Looking back at this time, Vedder said that playing music and then getting a shot at making a record and at having an audience and stuff, it's just like an untamed force but it didn't come from jock mentality. It came from just being let out of the gates. 
In 1992, Pearl Jam made television appearances on Saturday Night Live and MTV Unplugged and took a slot on that summer's Lollapalooza tour with Ministry, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Soundgarden, among others. The band contributed two songs to the soundtrack of the 1992 Cameron Crowe film singles, State of Love and Trust and Breath. Ament, Gossard, and Vetter appeared in singles under the name Citizen Dick, their parts were filmed when Pearl Jam was known as Mookie Blaylock. The band members grew uncomfortable with their success, with much of the burden of Pearl Jam's popularity falling on frontman Vetter. While Pearl Jam received four awards at the 1993 MTV Video Music Awards for its video for Jeremy, including Video of the Year and Best Group Video, the band refused to make a video for Black in spite of pressure from the label. This action began a trend of the band refusing to make videos for its songs. Vedder felt that the concept of music videos robbed listeners from creating their own interpretations of the song, stating that before music videos first came out, you'd listen to a song with headphones on, sitting in a beanbag chair with your eyes closed, and you'd come up with your own visions, these things that came from within. Then all of a sudden, sometimes even the first time you heard a song, it was with these visual images attached, and it robbed you of any form of self-expression. Ten years from now, Amon said, I don't want people to remember our songs as videos. Following the round of touring for Vita Loki, the band went into the studio to record No Code. Vedder said, making No Code was all about gaining perspective. Released in 1996, No Code was seen as a deliberate break from the band's sound since 10, favoring experimental ballads and noisy garage rockers. David Brown of Entertainment Weekly stated that No Code displays a wider range of moods and instrumentation than on any previous Pearl Jam album. The lyrical themes on the album deal with issues of self-examination, with Eamon stating, in some ways, it's like the band's story. It's about growing up. Although the album debuted at number one on the Billboard charts, it quickly fell down the charts. No Code included the singles Who You Are, Sam Play, Hail, Hail, and Off He Goes. As with Vita Loki, very little touring was done to promote No Code because of the band's refusal to play in Ticketmaster's venue areas. A European tour took place in the fall of 1996. Gossard stated that there was a lot of stress associated with trying to tour at that time and that it was growing more and more difficult to be excited about being part of the band. Pearl Jam commenced work on a new album following a year-long break after its full-scale tour in support of Binaural. McCready described the recording environment as a pretty positive one and very intense and spiritual. Regarding the time period when the lyrics were being written, Vedder said, there's been a lot of mortality. It's a weird time to be writing. Raskill changed the shape of us as people, and our filter for seeing the world changed. Pearl Jam released Riot Act on November 12, 2002. It included the singles I Am Mine and Save You. The album featured a much more folk-based and experimental sound, evident in the presence of B3 organist Boom Gasper on songs such as Love Boat Captain. Stephen Thomas Earlwine of All Music wrote, Riot Act is the album that Pearl Jam has been wanting to make since Vita Logie a muscular art rock record, one that still hits hard but that is filled with ragged edges and odd detours. The track entitled Ark was recorded as a vocal tribute to the nine people who died at the Roskilde Festival in June 2000. Vedder only performed this song nine times on the 2003 tour, and the band left the track off all released bootlegs. The work for Pearl Jam's follow-up to Riot Act began after its appearance on the 2004 Vote for Change tour. The time period between the two albums was the longest gap between Pearl Jam's studio albums to date and the new album was its first release for a new label. Clive Davis announced in February 2006 that Pearl Jam had signed with his label J Records, which like Epic, is part of Sony Music Entertainment, then known as Sony BMG, though J has since folded into RCA Records. The album Pearl Jam was released on May 2, 2006. A number of critics cited Pearl Jam as a return to the band's early sound, and McCready compared the material to V.S. in a 2005 interview. Amon said, the band playing in a room that came across. 
there's a kind of immediacy to the record, and that's what we were going for. Chris Willman of Entertainment Weekly wrote that in a world full of boys sent to do a man's job of rocking, Pearl Jam can still pull off gravitas. Current socio-political issues in the United States are addressed on the album. Worldwide Suicide, a song criticizing the Iraq War and U.S. foreign policy, was released as a single and topped the Billboard Modern Rock chart, it was Pearl Jam's first number one on that chart since Who You Are in 1996, and first number one on any chart in the United States since 1998 when Given to Fly reached number one on the mainstream rock chart. Pearl Jam also included the singles Life Wasted and Gone. To support Pearl Jam, the band embarked on its 2006 world tour. It toured North America, Australia, and notably Europe, Pearl Jam had not toured the continent for six years. The North American tour included three two-night stands opening for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. The band served as the headliners for the Leeds and Reading festivals, despite having vowed to never play at a festival again after Riskild. Vedder started both concerts with an emotional plea to the crowd to look after each other. He commented during the lead set that the band's decision to play a festival for the first time after Riskild had nothing to do with guts but with trust in the audience. In March 2009, 10 was reissued in four editions, featuring such extras as a remastering and remix of the entire album by Brendan O'Brien, a DVD of the band's 1992 appearance on MTV Unplugged, and an LP of its concert of September 20, 1992 at Magnuson Park in Seattle. It was the first reissue in a planned re-release of Pearl Jam's entire catalog that led up to the band's 20th anniversary in 2011. A Pearl Jam retrospective film directed by Cameron Crowe titled Pearl Jam 20 was also planned to coincide with the anniversary. In 2011, VS and Vitalogi were reissued in the springtime in deluxe form. Pearl Jam began work for the follow-up to Pearl Jam in early 2008. In 2009, the band began to build on instrumental and demo tracks written during 2008. On July 11, 2013, the band announced that their 10th studio album Lightning Bolt would be released internationally on October 14, 2013 and on the next day in the United States, along with releasing the first single Mind Your Manners. The band played a two-leg tour in North America during October and November, followed by headlining the final Big Day Out Festival in Australia and New Zealand in 2014. The second single, Sirens, was released on September 18, 2013. After selling 166,000 copies in its first week, Lightning Bolt became Pearl Jam's fifth album to reach number one on the Billboard 200. At the 57th Annual Grammy Awards in February 2015, the album won the award for Best Recording Package. In November 2015 the band played a nine-day tour of Latin America. In January 2016, the band announced a tour of the United States and Canada, including appearances at the New Orleans Jazz Festival and Bonnaroo. In April 2017, Pearl Jam was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. At the ceremony they were inducted by comedian David Letterman. In August 2017, the band announced the release of the live album and concert film Let's Play 2 from the band's shows at Wrigley Field in Chicago the previous year. The band launched a 2018 tour with shows in South America in March 2018, including shows at the Lollapalooza Festival events in Brazil, Chile, and Argentina, with the latter being cancelled due to heavy rain the night before. Followed by performances in Europe and North America. The tour included two shows for homelessness-related charities in the band's hometown of Seattle. Prior to the first shows of the tour, Pearl Jam released the song Can't Deny Me. In December 2019, Pearl Jam confirmed that they would be touring Europe in the summer of 2020. On January 13, 2020, the band announced that their album Gigaton would be released on March 27, 2020. In conjunction with the release of their 11th studio album, the band also announced tour dates in North America during March and April 2020. However, 
the North American leg was postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, with the aim to reschedule them for a later date. In September 2020, the band confirmed that their MTV Unplugged live set would be released on vinyl and CD for the first time the following month. In May 2021, Pearl Jam announced the release of a digital collection of nearly 200 concerts dating from 2000 to 2013. The collection of 5,404 individual songs, entitled Deep, is accessible by members of the Pearl Jam 10 Club. On September 18, 2021, the band played their first show since 2018 at the C.Here.Now Festival in Asbury Park, New Jersey, where former Red Hot Chili Peppers guitarist Josh Klinghoffer made his debut as a touring musician with the band. In May 2022, Matt Cameron was forced to miss his first shows in 24 years since joining the band due to testing positive for the COVID-19 virus. Josh Klinghoffer and Richard Stuverud played drums for Cameron. Compared with the other grunge bands of the early 1990s, Pearl Jam's style is noticeably less heavy and harks back to the classic rock music of the 1970s. 169 Pearl Jam has cited many classic rock bands and artists as influences, including The Who, Led Zeppelin, Neil Young, The Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, and The Ramones. Pearl Jam's success has been attributed to its sound, which fuses the riff-heavy stadium rock of the 70s with the grit and anger of 80s post-punk, without ever neglecting hooks and choruses. Gossard's rhythm guitar style is known for its sense of beat and groove, while McCready's lead guitar style, influenced by artists such as Jimi Hendrix, has been described as feel-oriented and rootsy. Pearl Jam has broadened its musical range with subsequent releases. As he had more influence on the band's sound, Vedder sought to make the band's musical output less catchy. He said, I felt that with more popularity, we were going to be crushed, our heads were going to pop like grapes. By 1994's Vitaloki, the band began to incorporate more punk influences into its music. The band's 1996 album, No Code, was a deliberate break from the musical style of 10. The songs on the album featured elements of garage rock, world beat, and experimentalism. After 1998's Yield, which was somewhat of a return to the straightforward rock approach of the band's early work, they dabbled with experimental art rock on the binaural album of 2000, and with folk rock elements on the 2002 album Riot Act. The band's 2006 self-titled album was cited as a return to their early sound. Their 2009 album, Backspacer, contains elements of pop and new wave. Critic Jim Derogatis describes Vedder's vocals as a Jim Morrison-like vocal growl. Greg Prado of All Music stayed, with his hard-hitting and often confessional lyrical style and Jim Morrison-esque baritone, Vedder also became one of the most copied lead singers in all of rock. Vedder's lyrical topics range from personal, alive, better man, to social and political concerns, even flow, worldwide suicide. His lyrics have often invoked the use of storytelling and have included themes of freedom, individualism, and sympathy for troubled individuals. When the band started, Gossard and McCready were designated as rhythm and lead guitarists, respectively. The dynamic began to change when Vedder started to play more rhythm guitar during the Vitalogi era. McCready said in 2006, even though there are three guitars, I think there's maybe more room now. Stone will pull back and play a two-note line and Ed will do a power chord thing, and I fit into all that. Legacy While Nirvana had brought grunge to the mainstream in the early 1990s with Nevermind, Pearl Jam's debut 10 outsold it in the United States, and the band became the most popular American rock and roll band of the 90s according to All Music. Pearl Jam has been described as modern rock radio's most influential stylists, the workmanlike mid-tempo chug of songs like Alive and Even Flow just melodic enough to get Mosier singing along. The band inspired and influenced a number of bands, including Silverchair, The White Stripes and The Strokes. The band has also been credited for inspiring the indie rock scene of 90s era urban Pakistan, that has since evolved into a rich rock music culture in the country.
Pearl Jam were ranked at number 8 by Rolling Stone magazine in its top 10 live acts of all time. Pearl Jam has been praised for its rejection of rock star excess and its insistence on backing causes it believes in. Music critic Jim Derogata stated in the aftermath of the band's battle with Ticketmaster that it proved that a rock band which isn't comprised of greed heads can play stadiums and not milk the audience for every last dime, it indicated that idealism in rock and roll is not the sole province of those 60s bands enshrined in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In 2001, Eric Weisbart of Spin wrote, the group that was once accused of being synthetic grunge now seem as organic and principled a rock band as exists. In a 2005 readers poll in USA Today, Pearl Jam was voted the greatest American rock band of all time. In April 2006, Pearl Jam was awarded the prize for Best Live Act in Esquire's Esky Music Awards. The blurb called Pearl Jam the rare superstars who still play as though each show could be their last. Pearl Jam's fanbase following has been compared to that of the Grateful Dead's, with Rolling Stone magazine stating that Pearl Jam toured incessantly and became one of rock's great arena acts, attracting a fanatical, Grateful Dead-like cult following with Marathon, True Believer shows in the vanishing spirit of Bruce Springsteen, The Who and U2. When asked about Pearl Jam's legacy in a 2000 interview, Vedder said, I think at some point along the way we began feeling we wanted to give people something to believe in because we all had bands that gave that to us when we needed something to believe in. That was the big challenge for us after the first record and the response to it. The goal immediately became how do we continue to be musicians and grow and survive in view of all this. The answers weren't always easy, but I think we found a way. Their 1992 MTV Unplugged performance was ranked second in Rolling Stone's list of its 15 best episodes. Campaigning and Activism Throughout its career, Pearl Jam has promoted wider social and political issues, from pro-abortion rights sentiments to opposition to George W. Bush's presidency. Vedder acts as the band's spokesman on these issues. The band has promoted an array of causes, including awareness of Crohn's disease, which Mike McCready suffers from, Ticketmaster venue monopolization and the environment and wildlife protection, among others. Guitarist Stone Gossard has been active in environmental pursuits, and has been an advocate of Pearl Jam's carbon-neutral policy, offsetting the band's environmental impact. Vedder has advocated for the release of the West Memphis Three for years and Damian Eccles, a member of the Three, shares a writing credit for the song Army Reserve, from Pearl Jam. The band, and especially frontman Eddie Vedder, have been vocal supporters of the abortion rights movement. In 1992, Spin printed an article by Vedder, entitled Reclamation, which detailed his views on abortion. In an MTV Unplugged concert the same year, Vedder stood on a stool and wrote pro-choice. On his arm in protest when the band performed the song Porch. The band are members of a number of abortion rights organizations, including Choice USA and Voters for Choice. 199. As members of Rock the Vote and Vote for Change, the band has encouraged voter registration and participation in United States elections. Vedder was outspoken in support of Green Party presidential candidate Ralph Nader in 2000, and Pearl Jam played a series of concerts on the Vote for Change tour in October 2004, supporting the candidacy of John Kerry for U.S. President. In a Rolling Stone feature showcasing the Vote for Change tour's performers, Vedder told the magazine, I supported Ralph Nader in 2000, but it's a time of crisis. We have to get a new administration. In 2006, the members of Pearl Jam founded the non-profit organization Vita Logi Foundation. Named after their third studio album, the foundation supports non-profit organizations working in the fields of community health, the environment, arts, education, and social change. Vedder sometimes comments on politics between songs, often to criticize U.S. foreign policy, and a number of his songs, including Bullet in Dollar Leaguer and Worldwide Suicide, are openly critical of the Bush administration. At Lollapalooza 2007, Vedder spoke out against BP Amako dumping effluent in Lake Michigan 206 and at the end of Daughter, 
he sang the lyrics George Bush leave this world alone slash George Bush find yourself another home. In the beginning of the second encore Vedder invited Iraq war veteran Tomash Young, the subject of the documentary Body of War, onto the stage to urge an end to the war. Young in turn introduced Ben Harper, who contributed vocals to No More and Rockin' in the Free World. 207 The band later discovered that some of the Bush-related lyrics were excised from the AT&T webcast of the event, and questioned whether that constitutes censorship. 208 AT&T later apologized and blamed the censorship on contractor Davy Brown Entertainment. Pearl Jam has performed numerous benefit concerts in aid of charities and causes. For example, the band headlined a Seattle concert in 2001 to support the United Nations' efforts to combat world hunger. 210 The band added a date at the Chicago House of Blues to its 2005 tour to help the victims of Hurricane Katrina, the concert proceeds were donated to Habitat for Humanity, the American Red Cross and the Jazz Foundation of America. 211 In 2011, Pearl Jam was named 2011 Planet Defenders by Rock the Earth for their environmental activism and their large-scale efforts to decrease their own carbon emissions. Band Members Current Members Jeff Ament, Bass, Backing Vocals, 1990, Present, Keyboards, 2017 Present Stone Gossard, Rhythm Guitar, Backing and Occasional Lead Vocals, 1990, Present, Lead Guitar, 1993 Present, Keyboards, 1993 to 1996. Mike McCready, Lead Guitar, 1990, Present, Backing Vocals, 2009 Present. Eddie Vedder, Lead Vocals, 1990, Present, Rhythm Guitar, 1993 Present. Matt Cameron, Drums, Percussion, Backing Vocals, 1998, present. Touring slash session members. Boom Gasper, keyboards, piano, organ, 2002, present. Josh Klinghoffer, guitar, percussion, keyboards, drums, backing vocals, 2021, present. Richard Stuvarod, drums, percussion, 2022, present. Former members. Dave Crusson, drums, percussion, 1990-1991, touring guest 2017, 2022, 213. Matt Chamberlain, drums, percussion, 1991. Dave Abruzzes, drums, percussion, 1991-1994. Jack Irons, drums, percussion, 1994-1998. Thank you for watching this video.